Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Kopetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. In the next few minutes, we'll be talking about new drugs to treat diabetes and lower cardiovascular events. Diabetes and obesity have been rampant, as we're all aware. In 2000, they predicted that there, by 2020, 30% of American adults would be obese. I really did not feel this would happen, certainly not by 2020. However, what has happened now is that 42% of adults are obese, and by 2030, 50% of American adults will be obese, and 33% will have diabetes. I think there is, this is absolutely going to happen. Why? Well, if you look at our youth, the adolescents age 12 to 18, one in five is pre-diabetic. Young adults, one in four. And then adults over 35, one in two are pre-diabetic. So it's coming. 86 million people in the United States have pre-diabetes and only about 9 million are aware of it. So diabetes is here, at least for the next few decades. So what do we have to treat them medically? Lifestyle, of course, is very important. But if you look at all-cause mortality in patients at increased CV risk, meaning at least a 5% risk of death, that are receiving metformin therapy, and you put on top of it other medications, specifically the SGLT2 inhibitors, which are sodium glucose cotransporter 2, and the GLP-1 agonists, the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists, you can see that there's benefit from both the SGLT2s and the GLP-1 agonists. So patients that have diabetes at increased risk, these two drugs have been shown to benefit CV outcomes. How do they work? The pathways. On the left is the SGLT2 inhibitors, and I'll show you how each of these reduce major adverse cardiac events, chronic kidney disease, blood pressure, and weight. The SGLT2 inhibitors on the left here increase glycosuria or urine uh, glucose, also sodium in the urine, naturesis, and uricosuria. That leads on the top to decrease preload, decrease afterload, and decrease epicardial fat. On the bottom, increases vasodilatation. So the hemodynamic effects lead to this decrease in cardiac events. On the right, the GLP-1 agonists reduce gastric motility. They reduce colomicrons in the bloodstream. Uh, increase insulin, decrease glucagon, so your postprandial glucose is lower. On the top right, you can see that this increases satiety, somewhat increases nausea, so there's a weight loss effect and anti-atherogenic effect, again leading to lowering of these cardiac events. Now, how do you select patients for the SGLT2 inhibitors or the GLP-1 agonists? The ideal patient on the left for an SGLT2 inhibitor are younger age, GFR greater than 60, they have known ASCVD or maybe overweight or obese, hypertension, either heart failure from reduced or preserved ejection fraction and albuminuria. Try to avoid the ones that have, uh, that have had DKA, either type 1 or type 2, with poor control. So a type 2 patient that has an A1C greater than about 7.5 to 8 or has an upper uh, 100, say 180 as their fasting blood sugar, they, we may want to avoid those patients. Uh, EGFR less than 45, try to avoid. If they tend to be dehydrated or get orthostatic symptoms, try to avoid because this does cause some, uh, some uh, dehydration. And then perineal infection risk, and that specifically is the uh, glucosuria, the extra sugar in the urine. On the right, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, the ideal patient, you want to get weight loss if they have ASCVD, avoid the ones with a little lower GFR of 30, They've had gastric surgery or gastroparesis. Remember, this decreases gastric motility. Or they have a history of the, um, of, uh, of the FH-MEN2 or medullary thyroid cancer. Avoid those patients. Now, how do we approach these? Once they're on metformin, low-risk patients, there may not be any benefit for additional therapy for total mortality or non-fatal outcomes. But the high-risk patients, like we talked earlier, we do see a decrease in total and CV mortality. De a decrease in stroke, decrease in heart failure, uh, and development of end-stage renal disease. Now compare this to some of our other drugs like uh, that have caused problems in the past, uh, this is quite beneficial. 
Now, we have to be careful with subcutaneous semaglutide because of uh, odds of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, the risk of amputation with canagliflozin, that's been, that's still, uh, data still evolving on that, but because liraglutide shows a decreased risk of amputation. So we'll have to stay, uh, stay abreast of these developments with the amputation. Now, what are the advantages of the STLT2 inhibitors versus the GLP-1 receptor agonists? Well, the SGLT2s, better overall cardiovascular protection, greater benefits for heart failure, greater benefit for chronic kidney disease, and they're oral. That's a big plus. The GLP-1 receptor agonists, greater efficacy in lowering A1C, once weekly dosing, and probably more weight loss. Now, how do you approach these patients? Well, if a patient's on a diuretic or an antihypertensive on the left, on the diuretic, stop or reduce the dose by about half, then reintroduce the treatment according to the clinical situation, meaning if the blood pressure starts to rise, you may need to restart it. Antihypertensives, uh, if the blood pressure is a little higher, 140 over 80 or greater, age over 65, or they have hemodynamically unstable issues, then reduce the dose of the antihypertensive revise upwards, again, according to the weekly blood pressure monitoring. What if the patient is younger on the right-hand side, has a blood pressure, again, 140 over 80 or above, but they're hemodynamically stable? Well, those are the ones we can continue the dose of the antihypertensive and then keep checking their blood pressure regularly and increase uh, or decrease as needed. Now, what are the common reasons people do not want to give uh, uh, these treatments? So is if you see the diabetic patients, we are the number one provider that sees these patients. We see them more than the endocrinologists do, actually, because diabetics have cardiovascular complications. Many of the comments are based around, it's not my role to control glucose. So this really isn't about glucose control. It's about lowering their cardiovascular risk, which is independent of the hemoglobin A1C. Others feel, well, I don't want to step on the referring physician's toes. Well, this, the cardiovascular endpoint is our endpoint. We own it. We need to do what we can to lower it and kind of lead the way in this area. And the other very legitimate concern is I'm concerned about side effects. What do I need to monitor? Because we haven't been used to treating glucose in the cardiology world. The adverse effects you need to be wary of the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, certainly the genital yeast infections go up because of the sugar in the urine. Volume depletion and hypotension can occur. Uh, DKA is very unusual, but it can occur uh, in, even in type 2 patients. Uh, necrotizing fasciitis or Fourier's gangrene is rare, but it's a scary complication. It's a, a, the infection, a perineal infection. Uh, UTIs are uncommon. Amputation and bone fractures, that data is still coming. The GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, they get nausea, some vomiting, diarrhea. There's the risk of the C-cell tumors. Uh, acute pancreatitis and worsening retinopathy is still being uh, uh, monitored and analyzed. Uh, so we trend to stay away from the patients that have those uh, pre-existing complications. So the real precaution is uh, the ketonuria or ketonemia. Uh, monitoring is indicated in patients taking an SGLT2 inhibitor who present with symptoms suggestive of DKA, like abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, dyspnea. So always think of that and warn the patient about it. Patients on metformin or an incretin-based therapy like DPP-4 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists should be monitored for GI side effects, lowering the, the dose of the metformin. The DPP-4 inhibitors uh, should be considered and vigorous fluid intake should be uh, instituted. So to summarize, the new drugs to treat diabetes and lower CV events, consider these two drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, in addition to metformin in patients that have ASCVD or at high risk. You can see we can reduce CV death uh, with both drugs uh, by maybe a, a half to about 15% with different drugs. The other thing that can be benefited is a reduction in heart failure, hospitalization, Again, by, a combina by either of these drugs, specifically the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, are the best. Uh, also, you can reduce end-stage renal disease with those uh, drugs. NMI and stroke, so non-fatal events, are also reduced. Thank you for your attention.